Good evening. My name is Rachel House Bennington. I'm one of the coordinators for this year's Colchester Holocaust Memorial Day, and I'm here with Professor Emeritus Reiner Schultz of the University of Essex History Department to talk about his experience with Holocaust research, the creation of Holocaust Memorial Week at the University of Essex, and his relationship with Dora Love and the Dora Love Prize. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, and you basically introduced me um, as Professor Emeritus, <laughs> the grand title of someone who has retired um, of the University of Essex. When did you start focusing your research on the Holocaust? It became a focus of my research and also my teaching basically only when I came to Britain in the early 1990s. My interest was after this disastrous period of the Third Reich, how did the post-Second post World War democracy work more successfully than the post-First World War democracy? So that's what I was interested in. So that also led to questions of European unity, um, and these kinds of issues. When I grew up, I was not German and most of, my, most of my fellow Germans were not German. Well, of course we were, we had the passport, but we would always describe ourselves as European, not as German because being German was discredited. And, I was, and that was my kind of driving force, the long shadow of uh, the uh, Nazi period and how did democracy to take hold in West Germany. But it's, there came a point obviously, and that was during my final years in Germany. And then um, with greater speed, if you so want, when I came to Britain, that I thought, no, I also need to look at the period itself. In particular, uh, with a broader perspective, because, and we will probably still come to that, yeah. um, the Holocaust, or however you wanted to frame it, Germany was slowly changing from the final solution to Holocaust as a, as a term, was Jewish-centered. Um, and there was very little other experience. Um, and that was what I was then again interested. Why do we remember uh, the Jewish experience, important as it is, obviously, but why do we ignore or know nothing about the experience of so many other groups who were also persecuted by the Nazis in different ways with different results, but persecuted and seen as undesirable. And in the early days of your research, what were your thoughts about why those early groups are, why those groups are, were ignored? We didn't see most of the other groups because they were still regarded as different, as other as not belonging, as being criminal, as being almost persecuted quite rightly or legally because they had done something wrong, uh, because they didn't fit into the beliefs and structures of society at the time and even in the 1960s and 1970s. And the Roma and Sinti, they were still outsiders. They had, at the time of the um, uh, Holocaust, the screening of the Holocaust miniseries in Germany, 1979, the battle for recognition as victims of Nazi persecution had just about begun with a huge demonstration led by Romani Rose, who is still today the chair of the Executive Council of German uh, Sinti and Roma, uh, at Bergen-Belsen, at this symbolic place of Bergen-Belsen. But, I, but they were still regarded as being kind of shifty, a bit suspicious. They are here today and somewhere else tomorrow. Uh, they probably took your laundry that you had put out to dry. Um, these kinds of prejudices were so deep rooted uh, that um, we didn't know about their experience and we didn't want to know about their experience, to be perfectly honest. In terms of the um, LGBTQ community, and probably we should use the term of the day and just use gay, okay. and in particular gay men, um, they were, had been criminalized before 1933. Male homosexuality was a crime. Um, 
And the, um, the legislation, paragraph 175 in the uh, German uh, penal code, was actually strengthened under the Nazis. There was a new paragraph 175a, uh, which was even more restrictive uh, on gay men. In 1945, gay men who were liberated from the camps in some instances found themselves immediately returned to prison because they had been deported to the camps before they had actually completed their prison sentence. And that was done under allied military government. Allied military government decided that paragraph 175, as it has existed before the Nazi period, was not a Nazi law and therefore could stay in force. And in Germany, in West Germany, mm. it's slightly different in East Germany and the GDR. In West Germany, this paragraph remained in force until 1969. Wow. And in the period between 1945, or let's say 1949, when West Germany became a more or less independent state, 1945 to 1965, 20 years, the number of gay men prosecuted for acts of male homosexuality was higher than the number of gay men prosecuted during the 12 years of the Nazi regime. So of course, there was still this deep seated, um, and this is more than suspicion, belief in society at large that the gay man had it coming. They just didn't obey the laws. They were going against nature. There was nothing wrong uh, with the way they were treated. And that is why there, they didn't tell about what happened to them because if they told about their experience, they would end up in prison again. Right. Or at least there was the danger that they would be prosecuted again. And then the other, numerically large group of victims that uh, couldn't really speak up were the disabled people. Um, it was in particular the uh, uh, mentally uh, disabled people who didn't have any lobby whatsoever. They couldn't speak out um, and certainly even their families felt embarrassed that they had disabled children and they wouldn't speak out. Um, so that's another uh, kind of impact on um, the general amnesia that we really don't, didn't take these groups into account. And then you have the numerically smaller groups, Jehovah's Witnesses. You also had, of course, this, the Poles, the subhumans in the East. And please always hear my, my inverted commas here. Um, and with the um, Iron Curtain, with the division um, of the world and in of Europe and of Germany into two parts, the Poles were on the other side. They were per se being communists. They were already kind of uh, under a, a general, um, under general suspicion. So you've come to the UK at this point in your journey, and you're establishing yourself. You've established yourself as an academic and you've decided to start focusing more on what happens during the Second World War to all of the minorities and with a specific view to teasing out what happens to the lesser examined minorities. How did that manifest for you in your work? Things really changed. And as I said, the um, Holocaust miniseries um, the uh, speech by Weizsäcker on the uh, 50th anniversary of the end of the Second World War, other events uh, around the same time added to that. Um, but I probably have to say I am I was and probably still am to, to um, some extent a local historian in the sense of digging where you stand. Okay. Uh, whilst my uh, research was not on Bremen, where I come from, it was on the... Um, uh, rural area of Celle, Landkreis Celle, the rural district of Celle. And in that district, and that is the district where Bergen-Belsen is uh, located. 
Um, so I was kind of researching on what happened in Landkreis Zelle, how a rural um, district turned so massively towards the Nazis in uh, the pre-1933 uh, period. And at the same time, I was doing some work for what was called the Central Register for Persecution under the Nazi regime in the state of Lower Saxony. Um, so I was acquiring a lot of um, local knowledge, if you so want, or locally based knowledge. Um, and I was then invited to join the team of researchers um, who were asked to update both the site, but more importantly, the um, permanent exhibition at Bergen-Belsen. Um, and I became one of the uh, project leaders there. And the difference to other projects, uh, or projects on other concentration camps um, who have now followed the lead that Bergen-Belsen took at the time was that we looked at the camp and who was incarcerated in this camp. And that immediately, of course, led to the realization that at the end of the war, uh, Bergen-Belsen was almost something like a mini cosmos of all groups persecuted by the Nazis. After Bergen-Belsen and the work that you did there, you're still based in the UK at this point because you've moved here from night in 92 and established yourself yeah. here. You've gone, obviously you go back and forth and you, and you still go back and forth. I know your partner has, has relocated um, back to Germany, but that you have your, your flat in London. Um, how did you end up at the University of Essex? That was just following- um, The academic. The, the normal kind of appointment uh, structure that there was an advertisement. I was working in London at the time my then referee told me, Reiner, you need to uh, apply for Essex. That's exactly the job that is right for you. I did. And they actually took me. They probably didn't know what they were getting, but there you go. So what was and, their reception to the work that you were doing and your focus on the Holocaust and, and those interwar periods? I mean, was it, were they receptive? Well, initially, and that's the irony of all my kind of, there was nothing straightforward in my kind of academic career. Or okay. my, uh, because my appointment originally was to teach European integration. Uh, because Essex was one of the universities that was very successful in, in attracting money from Brussels for posts in all sorts of fields, including history, but also sociology and political science that fostered the idea of European integration. Um, that was at the time when John Major was prime minister and he wanted in his own words to take Britain to the heart of Europe. Uh, the uh, the um, uh, regulation with, these, with the money from Brussels was that Brussels would pay for these posts for five years uh, and then the university had to take them over into their normal uh, staffing. Um, and um, by the time the um, Brussels money came to an end, my then head of department said to me, well, Rainer, it won't come as much of a surprise to you that here at Essex, uh, the interest in uh, European integration is not really that great you will need to think about something else that you can teach that, so that you can have students. <laughs> and, We're happy to keep you, but you're gonna to have to design your own curriculum. <laughs> kind of, well, not quite, <laughs> but yeah, kind of that. Um, and that led to including more and more of my uh, work, which, which was actually now increasing, heading up to the uh, secondment uh, um, to Bergen-Belsen uh, on the third right into the curriculum. And then from 2000, uh, to 2005, I was seconded to Bergen-Belsen. And then when I returned in 2005, I returned as head of department. When does the idea that Essex could foster something like Holocaust Memorial Week come to, come to you and, and how does it come to fruition? Well, it basically came almost immediately as I returned to Essex in 2005. The, um, my work in Bergen-Belsen had received quite a bit of publicity in, uh, on the university website, in the university 
at those times there were still printed versions of monthly bulletins or something of that sort. Um, so I was relatively well known for doing that stuff at Bergen-Belsen. Uh, and either towards the end of 2005 or early 2006, the Jewish Society at the university asked me whether I would be willing to join them for Holocaust Memorial Day in 2006. Uh, and talk about uh, my work at Bergen-Belsen, of what I was doing and what generally was intended at Bergen-Belsen, uh, which of course I gladly did. Mm -hmm. And I still remember I came into the room, students were sitting in a circle um, and it was maybe 20, maybe 25, that's it. And they were, from what I remember, my memory might be wrong, but they were all Jewish or very huge majority of them were Jewish. So it was basically preaching to the converted. It was basically talking uh, to those who already knew about the Holocaust in general, not necessarily about Bergen-Belsen, obviously, uh, but about um, why we do Holocaust Memorial Day. And then afterwards, I kind of talked to the um, president of the Jewish society, Dennis was his name, and said, now listen, this is, it was a really pleasant uh, evening. I really enjoyed the discussion, but we need to, to, to get bigger than that. It's, it's, this can't just stay within the Jewish society. This needs to be a university-wide educational and commemorative event that involves everyone, or at least potentially everyone, not just the Jewish society. It is not just for Jewish students and possibly Jewish staff. Um, to have a Holocaust memorial event. And that was basically uh, how it all started, that Dennis uh, said, yes, you're completely right. Um, and um, can we do something about it? And obviously being head of department, I was able to do something about it, more able probably than a normal uh, member of staff um, uh, would have been. So I just simply uh, made an appointment with the uh, then vice chancellor of the university, Ivor Crew, and told him that this is what I intended from 2007 onwards. And was, was the administration receptive to broadening the focus? They were actually and to, quite... And to giving you a week? They were, well, the week kind of came later, probably. Um, okay. uh, it, it was... Th th what I wanted to inform Ivor and had to inform Ivor about as um, uh, vice chancellor was that I was thinking of doing something for Holocaust uh, Memorial Day, which was wider than uh, an event uh, organized by the Jewish uh, society, the student uh, society. Um, and Ivor was in a way receptive, but also skeptical. Uh, we had a chat about it. And at some point, and this is the sentence that kind of, that I kept in my mind, he said, Rainer, are you sure this won't be too Jewish? And thinking about it from today, you might think, oh, wow, is Ivor being anti-Semitic here? No, 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 no. no. He is a member of the Jewish community Italy, in, yeah. in Colchester. But his fear was, and this tells you something about Holocaust Memorial Day at the time, that it was seen as a Jewish, a mainly Jewish centered event and not diverse and inclusive in the way that Essex aimed and aimed to be. Um, and um, Ivor's worry was that by having a kind of central university Holocaust Memorial event, it would exclude uh, other groups of the university. And um, so we talked about it and I tried to explain to him that if we just focus on the Jewish experience, we are not only missing a very important trick here. Part of but the story. Are, yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, once we uh, had agreed to go, uh, to go ahead, then I tried to come up with a program. The first year in 2007 was um, not quite a week, I think, but there was already a lot of potential. So from 2008, we actually call, uh, called it um, Holocaust uh, Memorial Week. And it was always um, a program that ran from a Monday 
to Friday, Saturday, the week in January that included Holocaust uh, Memorial Day, the 27th of January. And we tried to make it as broad as we could because my understanding of these kinds of events has always been we learn about the past in order to understand our present situation and to form a better future, which is inclusive. So to date, the Holocaust Memorial Day has grown into a week at the University of Programming. And it's been running for, this will be the 16th year? It started in 2007. I see. Uh, okay. Still as a kind of relatively unstructured event, kind of trying to find out, does it work? Does it not work? Um, but already then, I remember we had a round table um, uh, discussion, which included uh, the Human Rights Center, I think someone from um, uh, literature, uh, history, obviously. Um, so it's uh, already going beyond uh, history and uh, involving other parts of the university. And that was seen as being uh, the really productive um, uh, way forward. Um, and I also, in the early um, periods, the early weeks, we gave the um, a week a very specific focus. Uh, we started with more general discussions about memory and representation, witness the role of witness testimony, etc. That was when we got quite a few of survivors to the university to talk about their experiences. And then I try to broaden it to look at those groups persecuted by the Nazis who are usually not represented. So we had uh, one year focusing on um, Sinti and Roma, um, one year um, on gay men. And we did this in uh, very close collaboration with the Essex LGBT and Friends Society as they were called then. I'm not quite sure if they've now put the Q into their uh, name. Um, and that was a happy coincidence because the Essex uh, LGBT uh, and Friends Society is the oldest uh, or one of the oldest of its kind in the UK. And in 2011, it celebrated its 40th anniversary. And that's when we had Holocaust Memorial Week focusing um, on uh, the persecution of gay men. We also from the second or third year onwards went into town and had at least one event in town. Um, I set up what I called the Twilight Zone Cafe, which was held at the Minories Art Gallery. We set it up as a relatively informal uh, event. That's why we had the name Cafe. So uh, every uh, uh, person who came, uh, got a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and a piece of cake uh, to kind of create a, a feeling of informality. Then we had a talk of about half an hour, possibly 40 minutes. Uh, most speakers uh, tried a non-academic um, approach, i.e. talking without footnotes. Um, and then we had a discussion and the discussion was often extremely lively. Um, it was helped, obviously, that we had speakers who were well known in the local community, such as, for example, Dora Love, the Holocaust survivor who, who lived in, in, in uh, uh, Colchester. How did you meet Dora Love and what did she come to mean to you? And how I did met, the Dora Love Prize evolve? I met Dora actually during the first Holocaust Memorial Week in 2007. I knew there was a Holocaust survivor living in Colchester, uh, but I had been away from the university obviously until, until 2005. And there was never really a right moment to come to the Jewish um, community to meet her. So there she was in one of the events in 2007. And um, we were introduced by a mutual friend of ours uh, Jeremy Crickler, who you might know. Um, and yeah, then I don't know how it happened, but we somehow, as they say, hit it off and the rest is history. Um, so um, we did a lot of things together in the uh, following years, talks, uh, events, 
And um, in 2009, I nominated her for an honorary degree at the university, which again, there were a few hurdles okay. as usual that needed to be passed. I had strong support by the then chair of council, Bill Gore, um, that we do not just need prominent uh, uh, musicians or leaders of the uh, economy, businessmen, businesswomen who get honorary degrees, but that someone like Dora Love would be just as uh, 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 valuable for the university as anyone else. And my Lord, it was, I had the uh, honor to uh, give the oration, which was a very memorable moment, obviously. Um, me as a descendant of the perpetrator nation, uh, giving the oration uh, for someone who had suffered so much by my, the generation of my parents and grandparents and doing that in a country that had contributed so much to the defeat of the Nazi regime. And when Dora accepted her degree and gave her, I think they call it officially the acceptance speech or whatever it's called, mm -hmm. um, the whole uh, auditorium erupted in a standing ovation, uh, the like of which uh, Essex had not seen before and probably has not seen since. It was just absolutely remarkable. Wow. And Dora, took this extremely seriously, uh, this honor. Um, wherever she went, she made it uh, her purpose to introduce the University of Essex and what great work Essex was doing. Um, so she was an honorary graduate in the best sense of the word that she really advertised uh, the university. So her poems from Stutthof, how did those come to be published? Luckily, we managed to do that before she died. So she still saw a copy of this little uh, brochure that we uh, published. It was the initiative of a good friend of Dora's, um, Tanya White, uh, who said, oh, those poems really ought to be uh, kept alive for posterity. And the best way to do it is to, to publish them. Uh, they are so powerful, especially for a young generation. And so they found, um, she and her then partner found um, a publisher in Scotland who did it for a minimum amount of costs. And we had them published. The, uh, the poems themselves are remarkable in that they shouldn't even exist, so to speak. Uh, when Dora was rescued, maybe I have to go a step Back. She was in Stutthof concentration camp, which is uh, close to Gdansk in what is today Poland. Um, it was the last um, concentration camp that was liberated. When the um, Red Army uh, closed in on uh, Stutthof, uh, the uh, Nazi SS, etc., decided to put many of the uh, uh, prisoners who were still alive onto little boats, drag them out into the Baltic Sea and set them free, the boats, without water, without food. So this was a death march, which was not a march, but a drift across the Baltic Sea. Most died. It was against all odds that Dora survived. Um, and she was, at, after eight or nine days, she, uh, her little boat, where almost everyone had died, um, ended up at the coast of Schleswig-Holstein and she was swept ashore at exactly the moment that the British army marched in um, and they rescued her and uh, basically uh, placed her in a hospital in, in order to uh, um, nurse her back to health. Uh, she had TB, so had to be isolated. And during that period of isolation, uh, because she said she was going so crazy in her mind, she needed to do something. 
she wrote poems on all sorts of different pieces of paper that she could get her hands on or that her later husband, um, uh, the British officer who had found her on the shore, uh, brought to her with a pencil. And she, after she finished them, she uh, uh, put them, made them into a bowl and threw them under her bed. Uh, so she actually thought they were gone and had been destroyed when she left the hospital. Uh, unbeknown to her, her husband or later to be her husband uh, had actually rescued them and gave uh, her the collection of these poems um, some, I think about 50 years later. Um, so they are in a pretty uh, fragile state. Uh, and that's why we decided uh, to, to print them. And so they are thoughts by Dora about how life could or could not go on after the experience that she had at a time when she still believed she had lost all her family in the camp. Uh, it later turned out that her father had survived Dachau and one of her brothers who had fled into the Soviet Union before the Nazi invasion of Lithuania uh, had survived the Gulag and was living in the Soviet Union. Um, so she didn't, she hadn't lost everyone, but she didn't know that at the time. Right. And she was in her poem, she was kind of thinking about what hope is there. And she was thinking, which it's, it's a short little poem uh, that has a particular um, impact on young children where she kind of described um, when I was 16, what she did at the time, including digging for peat for the Germans, uh, being in a concentration camp. Um, and uh, of course today, the youngsters would say, I fell in love for the first time. I did my driver's license. And that's why it is so powerful because young people um, can relate to, to, to these experiences. And one of the poems was actually read uh, during uh, the funeral service uh, for Dora by her granddaughter um, from that collection. So it's a very precious little collection. It's only 10 or so poems. Um, but it is something that um, we use in the Dora Love Prize that I haven't even mentioned yet that it exists. It all started with an evening in remembrance of Dora Love during Holocaust Memorial Week in 2012. Um, Dora had died in October 2011 and I felt it was uh, almost our duty to remember the, uh, the woman who had done so much to support Holocaust Memorial Day, to advertise it, to broaden its appeal, to support it in every way she could, who had talked to schools and um, to the history department uh, at the university, um, and who was an honorary graduate of the university. Um, so we had a truly amazing evening uh, a mixture of reading of her poems, of excerpts of the interview she gave uh, to what at that time I think was still called uh, the Spielberg Foundation. I'm not quite sure what then became the Shoah Foundation. Okay. Uh, a very early interview that she gave in uh, the mid 1990s when uh, what she said was still really raw, um, very different from 10 years later. Um, we had reflections of um, people who had met her like in the Jewish community, uh, students. Um, and during that evening, I kind of thought this can't be all. I mean, we can't just do this one evening and that's it. So without any uh, talking to anyone really, I kind of decided at the uh, end of that evening, it took uh, place in the Lakeside Theater in Colchester filled to the rafters. Um, I said, well, from next year on, we will have a Dora Love Prize. Um, the university was a bit aghast. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, that, isn't in, that isn't in our liner notes, Reiner. What are you talking about? 
exactly. It was kind of, here he goes again. We can't let him loose. <laughs> and I didn't really know what it would be about. I just thought we needed to do something. I mean, seeing the love that she enjoyed, uh, the inspiration that she was, I thought we can't just leave it with this evening. That is just absolutely impossible. Um, so I, out of the uh, spur of the moment, say we will, said we will have a Dora Love Prize um, and later thought about what form it would take. Um, and it was a bit of experimentation that we, of course, did over the years, but I think it has been so far a very successful um, event, annual event, with uh, more and more schools participating until the pandemic hit. So what we do is that we ask um, students of, from schools in Essex and Suffolk, and we focus deliberately on Essex and Suffolk, A, because we just don't have the resources to go wider, but B, also because this is the um, region where Dora was most active okay. in terms of talking to schools. Yes, she talked uh, to schools in other uh, counties, but it was mainly in Essex and Suffolk. Um, so uh, we restricted it uh, to schools in Essex and, and um, uh, um, uh, Suffolk, and we invited students to develop projects that link what they were learning about the Holocaust with the world they live in today. We wanted them to kind of think about the connections, what happened to people who were uh, persecuted, marginalized, discriminated against during the Nazi period. Do we see them differently now? How do we deal with the hatred, the discrimination, the marginalization on our doorsteps today? So I always wanted them to do the link between the past and the present and possibly into the future. On the lines that I said earlier, we learn about the past in order to live more responsibly in the um, present and to develop an inclusive future for all of us. So one of the things that you have become involved with in the last five years is the Colchester Holocaust Memorial Day, which I had always assumed that it was a localized town event, but that was linked to the university, but that isn't the case. So how did you come to be involved in the Colchester Holocaust Memorial Day event? I came initially basically out of curiosity. My biggest fear is that Holocaust Memorial Day events, be they week long or just a day on the day itself, become rituals, become ceremonies that don't really mean anything. Um, and I had the fear as I, during the last Holocaust Memorial Week that I organized at Essex, that uh, it might at some point actually become almost something like a photo opportunity, something where you uh, produce nice photos that you can put into onto your website and then you can tick a box, so to speak. I mean, this is probably a bit harsh, but you see where I'm getting it. And it's also easy to cry over victims that have died in the past. It is much more difficult to take action today for those who are still prosecuted, who are still marginalized, desperate people who are alive, that we actually need to stand up for because that's what we should have learned from the Holocaust. And that's probably what attracted me to the events at first sight, the uh, Colchester Holocaust Memorial Day event, that it also made this link with the present that is so important to me. Um, because um, without, that, without that linkage, without thinking about what does it mean for today, quite frankly, we don't need Holocaust Memorial Day. We need to make that connection. Otherwise, it is actually something that doesn't really mean much um, and you notice, or you might not even notice that it is on the 27th of, um, of January. And it's even more important now that the number of survivors obviously become fewer and fewer. Mm. Um, and we lose the direct link 
to what happened in that period. And therefore the linkages to what's happening today are so important. Mm 